Hello and welcome to Wealth Manager where we help make your money work for you. On the show today with equity and debt investments looking attractive, we'll tell you how to make the best of both worlds. Nilesh Shah of Kotak Mutual Fund joins us. And we'll continue our series on estate planning and tell you all about creating a trust with Ashwini Chopra of Universal Trustees. Before we begin, here's what made news this week. In a move that adds sheen to the yellow metal, the government has unveiled a draft of the gold monetization scheme, a policy that seeks to mobilize gold held by households and institutions. The finance ministry's consultation paper proposes that customers would receive tax incentives on their gold deposits and banks will be free to decide their own interest rates. The deposits will be locked in for one year. However, customers will be given the option of breaking the lock-in. Experts say that the rate of interest offered by banks will be the key to the success of this scheme. SBI Mutual Fund has launched a new open-ended equity fund, the SBI Equity Savings Scheme. This will offer a combination of equity, arbitrage and fixed income and will allocate 65 to 90% in active equities and arbitrage opportunities, while 10% to 35% will be allocated to fixed income. Experts say that while such funds provide tax efficient returns, the arbitrage element will provide a lower volatility than regular equity funds. Equity markets have significantly corrected in the past few months. At the same time, there is a strong likelihood of a rate cut in the upcoming credit policy. This means that both equity and debt funds are equally attractive at this point. I caught up with Nilesha, MD and CEO of Kotak Mutual Funds and began by asking him if one should consider a portfolio reallocation between equity and debt. So currently both of them are attractively valued. We think over the next 6 to 12 months probably equity and debt will deliver similar kind of return. Okay. But year down the line, equities will start outperforming fixed income significantly. So keeping that kind of horizon in mind, you should be equally weighted between equity and fixed income based on your risk profile. If your risk profile recommends 70-30 ratio, then go for 70-30. If it recommends 30-70, then go for 30-70. But both equity and debt this year are poised to give good return to the investors. So talking specifically about debt, we are expecting probably in the upcoming policy itself, but overall maybe another 50 basis points rate cut from the Reserve Bank. Given that, what is your uh, sense for investors? How should they allocate within the debt portfolio? Which uh, themes or segments within the debt play space are looking for? So we are expecting interest rates to decline, probably 50 basis point this year. Right. And then eventually continuing the downward path. And keeping that in mind, it's worth going long duration. Okay. And today, when you have 10 year yield hovering around 785, 786, I think it's a great time to invest because you will see yields falling off over next 12 to 18 months. I wanted to ask you about fixed maturity plans. The middle, they completely lost uh, flavor with investors. Now they are coming back because of uh, the change in the structure of the plans itself. Uh, how do you view FMPs in the current market? So fixed maturity plans are essentially meant for conservative investors right. who want to lock into the yields and which is why the portfolio maturity is defined in terms of three years and so on and so forth. And you know roughly what kind of return you will get. Now FMPs are good for the retail conservative investors. FMPs are good for the corporate conservative investors but investors should remember that when you are going into conservative plans like FMPs you are locking into a return right and you are locking your money for about you know the maturity of the FMP right. even though you have liquidity available in secondary market mm -hmm. now as long as this is one part of your portfolio it is good but if it is all part of your portfolio then it is not good enough right because that will not give you upside of the return mm. which is possible in an open ended fund including fixed income fund like duration funds like guild fund or a bond fund right or in hybrid funds like mip and balanced fund right. so those funds also deliver conservative return with conservative risk mm. but they provide you upside of risk right. and hence fmp should be combined with a bond fund or a guilt fund mm -hmm. or a MIP or a balanced fund so that you have some upside also in the return. Right. 
Uh, so moving to the equity funds, uh, pharma and mid cap funds uh, have been outperforming in the past one year, even up to six months ago. The story has changed slightly in the last three months where pharma funds have given negative returns. But what is your sense? Do you expect that this uh, play con will continue going forward given the high valuations? So definitely in pharma stocks, the valuations had started becoming expensive. Right. And which is why they have now corrected a little bit so that earnings can catch up with them. Correct. On a broader basis, if you see India is transiting from a thousand dollar per capita GDP to two thousand dollar per capita GDP. Now, in that transition, where will people spend more money on? Certainly, healthcare will be one important subject. It's no longer roti kapda and makan. It's also a good health. Second, the kind of living which urban India is having, more pollution, more stress. Uh, I mean. And you know a lot of junk food. Will that result into need for more healthcare? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Now you combine these two things: one, people will have more ability to spend on healthcare, and second, they will have more need to spend on healthcare. Mm -hmm. This creates solid opportunity for Indian pharma companies over a longer period of time. Right. And now with this correction in prices as mm -hmm. well as valuation, you have an opportunity to enter. Okay. And what about the mid-cap space? Mid caps are volatile. Mm -hmm. Today, mid caps are trading at similar valuation as large cap, yes. or just marginal discount. Typically, we have seen that when mid cap starts trading at large cap valuation, that is not the time to invest into mid cap. So, my recommendation is that yes, of course, mid caps have ability to deliver better return, but it's better to invest in mid cap funds via systematic investment plan rather than one time investment. Okay. So, if you are comfortable taking the volatile ride of mid cap funds. Start an SIP and then continue to invest through SIP into mid cap funds so that you can take advantage of the volatility in mid cap funds. Right. We've been hearing from a lot of people, including yourself, that any correction at this point is an entry uh, point into the market. But what are the themes or the uh, sectors that you're seeing value right now? So, in the market today, we have something called cheap uh, valuations. Hmm. Uh, most of the PSU banks are trading below book. Uh, most of the real estate companies are trading below their market value. Most of the leverage entities are trading around book or below book. But they are all cheap stocks. They are not necessarily value stock. Okay. The value stocks are those stocks where probably the profit growth over the next two years will be higher than their current PE ratio. Mm. Value stocks are those stocks which are moderately valued vis-a-vis -vis their growth potential. And we believe that kind of modified approach on value which probably can be best described as a growth at reasonable price that's going to outperform the market in the days to come all right just hold that thought time for a quick break we'll continue this conversation with nilesha on the other side stay tuned Welcome back. I'm in conversation with Nilesh Shah of Kotak AMC. Uh, I also wanted to ask you about the ETF space. I mean, that's one space that hasn't really seen too much investor traction. But now we see uh, the EPF or funds is also going to be deployed into the ETF. Do you think that space is going to see some traction going forward? What is your sense? So why have retail investors not chosen ETF? Hmm. I mean, why will they choose ETF when most of the fund managers are outperforming, outperforming benchmark indices yeah. by a big, big, big margin. I mean, the worst performing Indian equity fund over the last 18 years have outperformed benchmark indices by a margin which is better than Warren Buffett's outperformance over S&P 500. So we are outperforming benchmark indices over sufficiently long period of time by a margin which is, you know, going to put Mr. Buffett on shame. So that's why ETFs are not taking... Uh, you know, traction with the investors because they know the actively managed funds are outperforming passively managed funds. Yeah. Now, EPFO is contemplating to invest for exchange yes. traded fund. It's a fantastic move because they are going to invest in line with index. So they don't have to worry about index outperformance or index underperformance. Traditionally, index will always have blue chip companies and hence they are investing in quality businesses. When you're buying ETF, you're buying the entire market, so you get complete diversification. Right. So I do foresee that exchange-traded funds will become part and parcel of the investor's portfolio called CEPFO. Mm -hmm. And over a period of time, when the actively managed funds 
start kind of uh, coming nearer to the benchmark, ETFs market can take off. How do you compare the investor sentiment today that we are seeing in the last one year to the pre-2008 crisis, um, the highs that we saw at that time? So how, how, how has investor sentiment changed? So in 2008, there was greed available. The investors were rushing in because they thought their returns will be 30, 40, 50 percent overnight. Mm. In 2015, I think the greed is much, much lower and much, much lesser than what it was in 2008. Today we have 78 lakh smart Indians who are doing SIP in equity mutual funds. Mm. That's a fantastic number. Mm. In 2008 this number probably would have been 15 or 20 lakh. Okay, wow. So there is a set of investors who have become smart, who have learned from their experience, mm. who have learned from some other's experience and started doing regular investment. That's a big, big, big positive. I want to talk about the goal monetization scheme. I know you've just had a brief glance at the regulations. but Initial reactions, what are you making of these uh, guidelines? So one has to appreciate that you know, you are asking bank to do the deposit collection of gold, which is fantastic because they have the network. Now, how are they going to leverage this gold becomes very, very critical. If it's lending to the jewelers, then only certain amount of gold can be absorbed by them. And we also need to worry about the credit risk. If I am lending gold to a jeweler, he better pay me pay me back. And how is it that going to be ensured? My feeling is that the government should still explore the option of utilizing gold options market to hedge the risk. So let's say you get 100 rupee worth of gold from an investor and you go and buy gold options on a five-year basis in international market. Your cost will be probably between 15 to 20 percent. So the, you definitely has a 15 to 20 percent outflow and that also in dollar terms. But balance 80 rupee invested in Indian rupee market will go back to 100. Mm. And now if gold prices fluctuate, you will get similar return from the option. So you will be able to provide principal protected return to the investors. Mm. If gold prices drop, he gets back his principal. Mm. If gold prices go up, he gets his appreciated value. That kind of product will have far more appeal to retail investor than this bank deposit kind of thing which is going to yield probably 1 or 2 percent return. That's not going to excite investors. But when I go and tell someone that look, if gold prices drop, you get your principal back. If gold prices go up, I will deliver you same return. That's something which is going to excite people. So the reason I'm asking is because in a recent open letter that you wrote uh, to Jim Rogers, you mentioned that if executed well, these schemes have the uh, ability to reduce Indians' craze for gold. How effective do you think this will be in actually channelizing or what really does the government need to do to ensure that that actually happens and the hoarded gold is channelized properly? If we can reduce this appetite of gold, Last year we imported $38 billion worth of gold, before that it was $25 billion worth of gold, before that it was $50 billion worth of gold. Over last five years as a nation we have imported more gold, silver, diamond and pearl than what we have received by way of FDI and FII. Mm. If by Harry Potter's magic wand I can stop this consumption of gold, I don't need foreign flows. India as a country is a net foreign flow investor rather than recipient. For a poor country like India, can we afford this kind of gold craze? Now what government should do is that it's difficult to get this kind of patriotism from Indian citizens. Mm. We need Mahatma Gandhi who can probably tell citizens that you have to part with your gold because the country needs it. But maybe we can, you know, push some regulations on the charitable trusts, temples which are holding gold. Please keep whatever gold is required for your deities. But the excess gold, can you not deposit it with the government? Mm. And government will return that gold back to you whenever it's needed. And use that gold through derivatives, instruments or lending mechanism mm. to ensure that we don't have to import gold. We can just circulate our domestic gold. And my final question to you is, so what would be your advice to investors at this point in time, especially those who are looking to enter the equity markets in this correction? And also any thoughts on where you see the Nifty uh, by the end of this year? It's really difficult to predict where will Nifty go over the next one year. It all depends upon where will oil go, where will government's reform process go, what will happen to Greece and so on and so forth. My point is that why do you want to look for next year's Nifty? Why don't you look inwardly? about your portfolio allocation. Mm. 
when many people say when there is correction in the market when there is volatility in the market it really scares us and i am saying that it's not volatility in the market which scares you it's the volatility in your behavior which should scare you if markets are down 30% instead of regretting that they are down 30% i should be happy that i am able to buy more so don't look at where nifty or sensex are going over one year just participate in the india growth story apple is a great company it's world's largest market cap company it's 750 billion dollar market cap the cash on apple's balance sheet is 30% of india's foreign exchange reserve apple has delivered 19% compounded return over last 25 years since 1991 there are four companies whose brand power is nothing compared to apple but who have delivered better return than apple in india now all these four companies one should could have invested in 1991 but people kept on looking at what will happen to next year sensex and ended up losing this thing so don't look at next year what's going to happen just buy companies which are great which are managed by good entrepreneurs and write this india growth story time for another quick break we'll come back with our estate planning segment stay tuned